So a very warm welcome uh, at uh, the University of Applied Arts to a book presentation, a presentation of a wonderful, it's not only beautiful, but a very important book, especially in times of change, uh, as the title is, uh, uh, Design, Art and Design Education in Times of Change. Uh, actually, we are living in times of change in a few years, and this will come sooner than we all believe. In a few years, uh, a lot of things will have changed. Uh, the ways we are living, the ways we are communicating, the ways we are working, all this will change in a dramatic way. Only the way we used to act in a creative, in an intuitive way, this still will be the domain of mankind. And this needs a basis. Intuition, creativity, how we will able to influence the way of civilization. This will need intuition, this will need creativity, this will need the tools and the skills which are learned by art and design, by art education, from primary schools up to art universities. This we must have in mind, and we is something we not enough can tell to our politicians, that this is the basis of our civilization. This is the basis of what will be the role of mankind in the 21st century, in a century which already is and even more will be dominated by things like artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, and robotics. But there is a way and there is a room for our influence, and this is uh, what is taught by the arts, to take risks, to deal with intuition, to deal with uncertainty, ambiguity. All these are core competences we use together with the arts, either by producing arts or by using arts of a fountain of inspiration for anyone. And the arts will have to become more than it is now, and if I say arts, I always mean the artistic way of design and architecture as well. Arts will have to become more than now a part of the center of our life. We'll, come, we'll have to come back, and I do say back, into the center of our society again. And therefore, people who are dealing with art and design education are so important, and therefore, are people who are making conferences and books like these are so important. And therefore, I congratulate and thank uh, Ruth Matthias Beer and uh, Louise Reitstetter, the editors of this uh, wonderful book, and not only the editors, but only those who uh, had a lot of things to do in organizing this international conference, or let's say rather the international conference on art education worldwide. So thank you uh, for your efforts uh, in organizing this conference, uh, which was quite a uh, success, and uh, in making this book. Uh, and thank you all for coming and uh, paying your interest in this topic, how art and design education will be a part of our times in which are times of change. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much, dear President. Um, without you, uh, such projects are not possible. Um, neither a conference and neither books like this are possible without a, a very generous president supporting um, our engagement. Uh, dear all, I'm very pleased that uh, all of you could take the time to join this afternoon or evening. We decided to speak English because we have some colleagues here who are morally speaking English. I hope that's fine for you. And uh, yeah, uh, to start uh, about the, con the, the conference, actually, um, this book is a, uh, not a conference proceeding. It's a peer-reviewed conference book. And um, we had uh, chosen the title from uh, Bob Dylan, The Times That Are Changing. And if you read the text carefully, it's uh, not a coincidence that we have chosen um, this Nobel Prize uh, literate uh, for our times nowadays. Uh, the Symposium on Art and Design Education in Times of Change was organized as, as a European Regional Conference of INSEA. INSEA is the International Society for Education through the Arts and is the biggest organization for art and design or education of the world. And last uh, October, no, September, um, uh, we had the conference in, in Vienna. We had more than 200 participants from over 40 nations and we were very proud to host them. And um, again, I also must to thank very much our um, uh, Department of Public Relations, um, Anja seibenbusch hufschmidt but especially also Jasmin Vogel, who was very important uh, in our co collaboration for the conference organization. Yeah? Uh, and all the technicians also we have to mention that helped us. Yeah. Empowering co-articulations and participation by artistic means um, do not only offer solutions to problems, they become interventions. How diversely art and design education can act will be shown in the following papers and books. Maybe just to give a short um, information about, we had uh, some keynotes and they were about special topics. Uh, we will focus the later. Uh, but most important was that we focused on museum education, we focused on um, diversity uh, challenges of our times, we focused of course on digital and migrational aspects and many others which we will discuss a little today. And now I think um, we have really have to get a person on stage that was really important to us. It was Pia Mona Schala, our graphic designer. She will start because this book is also so important because it's so beautiful and very well done. And you'll get a brief introduction how about the design of the book. Maybe, maybe to add one more thing, um, Pia Schala is uh, an alumni of the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. She did not study only industrial design, she also studied graphic design. And she's kind of responsible for the whole copyright identity um, of not only of the Department of Art Education, um, but also um, of the, the books and she will present. And this is also very important for you to see how important it is to invest um, in good graphic design to have something like this. Um, well, I'm glad uh, to participate in that project since 2015. Dart is um... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so since 2015, I'm part of that project. Wood came to me with the quest of a visual identity for a platform, how she said, a center, um, a possibility to get focused in something different topics, so I came up with a variation of generated patterns that would be needed for all different kind of uh, reasons, if that is, um, if that is a conference um, system to guide people somewhere, the books, also the booklets. <laughs> magnetism for our interests. Well, I'm hopping through them, but that alone wasn't it. So there's also a, a logo with a changing apostrophe, and she will pronounce the French word. 
Yeah, I tried to French was a long time ago, but it's uh, the idea is actually for this department, which is uh, kind of collaborating with the Department of um, um, Fachdidaktik, is DART. It's actually a Hochschulraumstrukturmittel project, which is funded by the Ministry of um, uh, Science and uh, Finances. And we gave it in as a, as a project and called it DART. And DART actually comes from Didaktik DAR. Je pense que c'est vrai, je ne sais pas. That's why I couldn't pronounce it, thank you. Um, so to see that it's a, actually a quite a big project, we already had a conference, we already made a book, we created one, with, we selected papers, we had booklets. So this is part two, and it's great to see how it evolved and developed through it. And to figure out how many stages of preparations these two ran through with me, um, this is the registration, you see t-shirts, buttons, everybody got name tags, and you have to register for the different workshops. It's quite a lot of work and it was really a lot of fun, to be honest. Um, the visual to what Ruth mentioned before is how international the conference was, and how many keynote speeches and lectures, workshops. To the book itself, um, the inside is um, scientific, so it must be about the text. It starts with a very, how do you say, calm, almost odd page. Uh, says the author, the abstract, the keynotes, and gives you an overview of what will follow in the next pages. Therefore, it's rudimentary down to black and white to give everybody the same chance, even if they have professional pictures or a mix. This one is a good example because they have graphics, paintings, and pictures in various light systems. And the guideline is with the color of the conference, and that way it was mint. Next one I pass already on. Yes, I just briefly walk you through our book. Um, I have to say, we had this really huge, huge conference. <laughs> it was kind of overwhelming. It was three days full of program. And afterwards, we had a call for paper just for the round of people that participated in the conference. We got an enormous feedback also for the call for papers. And we finally, in this double-blind peer review with various experts, international experts, we selected 28 papers. Afterwards, we grouped these 24, eight papers, um, 28 papers um, into four sections, and I have to say that for sure some papers, uh, as these are all interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary papers, could be part of several sections, but we start with actions. I just follow on. We always introduce our section with one paper of our keynote speaker, Pascal Gielen really made, he was also the first introducing the conference theme and he wrote a book about art and design education in times of change. And then we really talk about artists, educators, activists, and about their social practice and how they really politically and very actively engage in the civil sphere. Um, the second one um, is, a, is our museum education um, department, I would say, which is very strong at our university here. It was introduced by a very renowned um, speaker, Jocelyn Dodge, of the University of Leicester and the Center for Museum Studies there. Um, and then we've got several papers that very focus, uh, it's really about what museums deal with today. It's about their social role, it's about it's also about um, migration, it's about also a lot um, we have to deal with new technological changes that become ordinary but still need to be debated in the museum. Um, I was third um, part and I think it's really very good working also with the corporate identity of DART. It's all about patterns that we have to deal with, aesthetic experiences with, with, with literacy. And um, it's also about what will be the future of art education if art and the social practices within are changing. Our last part is about identities, and here we deal a lot, as we also had been a very international conference, also about non-Western contexts and about, um, I would say, these becoming mobile subjects and what does it mean to work and live between cities, between continents. And here we've got some very some interesting papers and it's also about embodied practices. And you see the last um, 
paper is Buddhadito Chattopate, and we are very, we are very glad. And I'm introducing already. We've got four, four presentations today of our speakers. So we really just did the intro, but we will give the floor to four, to four participants and four contributors. So we will have three very short presentations, and at the end. Um, by, um, we will start with Pia Ratzenberger, then we have got Gerd Hasenhüttel, then we have got Vir Mila Moschik and Virginia Louis, and in the end we have got Buddha Dito Chattopatyai, and he will do a sound performance in the end. But I'm very happy to give now the floor to Pia Ratzenberger. <laughs> But I want to introduce her first, Pia Ratzenberger, she, is, um, she studied art history in Vienna and she did a very great project that perfectly fitted the conference and also the, the afterwards book. It's about Tabadur, which is Arabic and means exchange. Um, she, um, she did it together with the association Cerebics and four different Viennese museums and what I think is really great in her project project that is really engaging but also a lot a very reflective, reflective what it means to work with asylum seekers and shortly move people to Vienna with an art context and in this time also an art historical transdisciplinary context. Thank you Luise and also thanks from my side for the perfect organization of the conference and also of the book. Thanks a lot. Um, well, I will just say some few words about Tabadul. As Luisa said, it's Arabic and means exchange. So um, exchange was the main idea of the project. Um, the first project, because now the second was in October 2016, the first started last year in March 2016. Um, I met some young men from Syria and they told me that they would like to study at the University of Vienna and were also interested in art history. And so I decided to offer them a program to practice academic methods and to get engaged with art historical objects. And I was studying Islamic art history myself, so I wanted to show them the objects from Vienna, which are in different museums, like Kunsthistorische Museum or the Dome Museum. And um, the project can be divided into three phases. So in the first phase, we went together to the museums, visited the objects, and then we met once a week for seven weeks, and elaborated uh, presentation texts in German language. So um, we did together research on the object and um, the four young men learned how to describe and work with libraries in the university context. And in the second phase, they were presenting the objects to a German-speaking audience. And after this, we had a discussion together. And this discussion was about culture and the understanding of culture. Because all objects they described were originally from Arabian countries or Persian countries, and they had an Arabic inscription. So, they were the experts to read these Arabic inscriptions loud in front of the audience. Um, and they also had a great amount of knowledge about history in, for example, um, Syria, from where some of the objects had come. And well, the objects were used in Christian context, so they came to Austria, for example, a glass bottle from Syria in medieval times and were used as reliquaries. So there was also the question, how do we see culture today? How do we understand this glass bottle as something Arabic, Islamic, for example? But 600 years ago, the bottle could have been seen as something Christian. And so there was the question, how is our culture nowadays 
um, understood by people to mostly to a limited geographical area to one nation or one um, religion. For example, if you think to Syria, you might think about uh, Arabic and Islamic, but 600 years ago, people might have thought this is um, a Christian object. So through the object, we came to this discussion about the way and the understanding of culture. And next to this, to the discussion, which was about all the, um, yeah, which was um, between the participants and the attendants, I also wanted to give the attendants, the Syrian men, the chance to act as art educators and to be art educators and give their knowledge to the people who attended the final event. Because in my, in my article, I'm also criticizing that museums are always offering a lot of projects for refugees or asylum seekers and do not give them the chance to do something on their own and to give something to an audience. And so this is something I wanted to establish with my project. And well, um, we did the project a second time with four different museums and now we are planning to um, that the group that is called now Tabadu, so we are now a fixed group of people from Syria and Iraq and me and also people from Austria, that they can organize their own projects within the society or association Cerebics and we'll hope that there will come out a new project and you are all invited to visit them and to get to know the group. And yeah, thank you for listening. You'll find more in the book. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, presenting this very interesting project. Um, the next uh, uh, speech will be given by um, Dr. Gerd uh, Hasenhüttl. I'm very, very pleased to introduce him to you. If you are involved in design studies, it's important um, you will meet his writing. So it's very seldom that you find somebody who studied industrial design, by the way, also at our university, and then doing his um, PhD and writing and publishing quite a lot on, on design studies. He holds several teaching um, positions at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and at our university. And from 2010 and 2011, you were research fellow at the International Research Institute for Culture Technologies and Media Philosophy in Weimar. Mm -hmm. And after your PhD in 2008, you have been in, um, uh, in, uh, at the um, uh, Institute for Architectural Theory, assistant professor. And um, actually you are publishing in the fields, as I said, design studies, drawing research and cultural technique research. And we are very happy um, to listen now to very short input about the book because you will all, all just get a teaser because of course we are more interested that you read the book. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me. I made a rather historical work about four different uh, pedagog pedagogic um, design teaching programs uh, which started 100 years ago uh, in Russia at the um, Ladovsky uh, Polytechnic uh, School in Moscow. Uh, it was the psychoanalyst um, research facility for architecture. The, uh, this was my first um, study of inquiry. Uh, my second example for um, design laboratory is the design laboratory uh, which started in New York in the 1930s, founded by Gilbert Rohde, also a very historical account. And this laboratory has also a very huge impact in the future directions. Um, 
for teaching design in the technocratical context. So my third chosen example uh, has been the design research laboratory founded by Christopher Jones. He's a well-known person in the design research field uh, around the year 1964. And my last example in this short text is the well-known Neil Gershenfeld's uh, fabrication, fabrication laboratory which also uh, lives on up to today and informed many, many uh, teaching programs uh, with that specific idea uh, using the laboratory metaphor for reformulating uh, and reforming art education. And this is the crucial point for my text and for my question in the title. Uh, because my investigation is out from the field history of science and media archaeology and I was very interested about the fact uh, why is the laboratory metaphor so, such a strong tool? Yeah? Everybody is talking about laboratories and with this metaphor uh, many practices in art and design will be reformed and will be uh, strengthened as a scientific practices. And this is, for me, a, a very crucial point in my analysis of these uh, several teaching programs and curricula. And I, I was infused by that question uh, which Bruno Latour made in his book about the pasteurization of, Fra of France, where he is thinking about um, Louis Pasteur and the dairies, so uh, milk production facilities, and he's thinking about what, what, why, what is, is doing the laboratory metaphor there, and what is um, making the, the laboratory metaphor specific for the practice of Louis Pasteur. Yeah? And he found out, Bruno Latour, that uh, Pasteur uh, formed very specific conditions for the existence of microbes. Yeah? And these conditions are formed in the laboratory context. And this is the point because you just can see the microbes in the laboratory context and you just can produce real good qualitative milk in this context. And you need uh, this special context for a safe production of milk. So this infused me very much because I later on thought about this idea why so many uh, university programs have t taken up this idea of the laboratory and what, what is this idea enhancing in the practice of these uh, schools. And one of my results is or arguments is that uh, in a similar way to the, that argument of Bruno Latour, um, by using this metaphor of the laboratory, um, such uh, programs, how they existed now in, in, a, in great variations, do um, produce or better reproduce very certain conditions under which you can make a kind of artistic practice um, you can transform a kind of uh, tr uh, artistic practice into a more strengthened scientific practice yeah and you see maybe you see facts where before no facts have been yeah because artistic work is very fluid uh, ungraspable work and I think this is one argument why the, the, the laboratory metaphor is so strong um, also in recent years now. But um, also Ruth Matthias Bär have founded a laboratory for art education. Um, 
And I think uh, the paradigm is changing yeah, in the 21st century because in the early years, 100 years ago, at the Ladovsky Laboratory, uh, everything was focused on perception. Yeah? And to, to make good art was coupled to the way how you see the world, how you percept the world, yeah? to cognitive abilities. And this changed very rigorously because now artists are not uh, figures which have a right perception. Artists are more, uh, are, are working very strong interdisciplinary and using several methods. And also the laboratory, one last point, is changing insofar it is getting uh, invisible. The laboratory is no more a room or a space. It's, uh, spacelessness is a very crucial point for the laboratory studies or studio studies. And also the artist studios or the design studio have changed uh, in course of these uh, paradigm changes to a kind of a, a design laboratory or artistic laboratory. So I hope it was a little bit of insight for you. It wasn't too confusing. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much, Gerd. Uh, now it's my pleasure uh, to present two young women. Uh, one is um, Mila Moshik. Uh, she um, is actually a paper and photo conservator and curator, actually recently gallerist and artist based in Vienna. And she is currently writing her PhD. I'm very glad I am allowed to be her supervisor. Um, and uh, she writes and researches about material semantics and the syn synesthetic reception of frames in photography. And uh, since quite a long time now, she's researching actually uh, um, about stories and information and objects related to the culture of money. And she inspired me um, to make a a seminar on war on cash and uh, in the seminar on war on cash which is actually quite interdisciplinary led and also with strategies of applied design thinking um, uh, Virginia Louis Chana met and, um, and they uh, collaborated in a conference paper they were writing a conference paper and also presented in Montreal um, at a conference their outcomes. And um, Virginia is a multidisciplinary designer and artist. Actually, she's studying social design. She's doing her master project, actually, on the topic of work, a very interesting one. And um, she uh, engaged, actually, she studied architecture at the University of Sydney and practiced a range of architectural firms before she was starting to study with us. And she has worked on projects dealing with a wide range of topics, including urban design and rights to public space, affordable housing, migration, and right-wing populism. She is, by the way, also a member of the Politics of Fear Collective. And I very warmly would like to invite you, because you have nothing else to do. The sun is shining. But actually, um, we would love to invite you tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at the Kunsthaus, um, Hundert Wasserhaus, we have um, the next opening. This will be um, an exhibition by the Collective Politics of Fear. So, after my advertisement, um, I will give you the voice and um, ask you to talk about your topic. Thank you. First of all, thank you to Ruth that you are so open minded and think in such an interdisciplinary way. Um, yes, I tell you a little bit about the interest in this very emotional medium <laughs> and of course very influential one. Um, I want to ask you all the question, um, could you think of drawing a 10 euro bank note? I mean, it's just a so important medium, but if it really comes to the point to think about such little things, um, I'm sure you might have some you might have some uh, difficulties in this, uh, uh, with this task. Um, I have the impression that there is uh, less and less cash um, today, so it's uh, now the point to think about uh, all these habits and rituals linked to, this, uh, of the to the physical aspect of this medium. 
and um, as I'm a conservator and also collector of memorabilia and ephemera, mainly 19th century stuff, um, I always had to do with the, the materiality of things and the objects are always um, um, a starting point for questions uh, to me. Um, I wanted to show you some, uh, some objects you might not think of. Uh, these are uh, 19th century postcards. Uh, it, they are lithographs and they are depicting um, a hand. This one is a depicting... Um, okay, I hand it around, <laughs> but be careful. <laughs> Uh, so the one is uh, depicting a hand with money and it is embossed and gilded. And this was a typical New Year's postcard. And if you turn around, um, so the one, the, the one side is wishing you luck, it's wishing you money. And um, it has all this, uh, it's depicting the physical qualities in a quite decorative way. And if you turn around, uh, the postcard on the other side is depicting uh, being broke. Uh, there are rats uh, in a case <laughs> with no more money left. And um, I now have a collection of nearly 6,000 such postcards, <laughs> um, which have a really wide range of symbols connected to money on it. And there are a lot of uh, customs and symbols which are not, we, we don't have to, um, yeah, a lack, a lack of knowledge in that. And then in this cultural and historical um, uh, difference, you realize uh, the change. Uh, or just if you think of this gesture being broke, you know, like this. <laughs> But if uh, cash does not exist anymore, so how, how you will uh, transmit this information or if you want to educate your child, so if this uh, medium is really, uh, there's a lack in that, how you do you want to transmit uh, this? And these are just some questions. Um, I uh, so first of all, I, I heard about uh, the cashless society from my father actually, who was working on a development of a mini city in, in the Gold Coast of Australia. And he was convinced of turning it into a cashless city. I remember I was in a meeting with him um, and the vice president of WeChat um, to discuss the developments of an app where when you enter the city, you will pay everything with, through this app. So when de delving more into this topic, I was constantly asking myself questions such as, in what ways does a demolition of cash feed into consumerism? What might a cash-free society look like? What histories, rituals, and manners of use are connected to cash? How is cash depicted in mass culture? And so on and so, so forth. So I was coming not definitely not from economy or, or any sort of um, field that is connected to this topic, I was definitely torn between these questions and I was unsure of what to believe or even fight for. So I was concerned about our everyday experiences and relationship to banknotes in its sensory, cultural and aesthetic qualities. And this was a starting point for me to grasp the demise of this medium. I wanted to create a project that addressed these vital questions by inviting participants to engage with the haptic and sensory qualities of this medium. So I set up a website called onecash.net where participants were able to engage with the topic by completing tasks. So some of the tasks included Task 10, take a photo of where you normally store your secret cash stash. Task 13, try to draw as accurately as possible a five euro note without looking at one. Task 5, sometimes we do strange things with our cash, only later, days, months or years after the event, realizing how unusual it was. You probably told a friend or a colleague about what you had done and then realize 
through his or her reaction how strange that activity was. Or perhaps you met someone who had also done what you have done. Write down your uttermost taboo experience with money on a piece of paper. So I had some responses from participants, and I'll just read two. I also, some of them also involved photographs, so there are some photographs and there was sound um, recordings that people made. 20th of October, 2016, by Anonymous. We converted all of our rubies to US dollars before we left Russia and carried all of this money in our clothes strapped to ourselves. 1991, before bank transfers were common, and especially not from the Soviet Union to offshore accounts. 15th of October, 2016, by Anonymous. I was 14 years old and I worked for a week. I had, the first I had my first summer job. When I finished and I got my salary, I bought a pair of very cool shoes and I was very proud and happy. Thank you. I also wanted to mention that uh, in front of the Deroteum there is uh, Milaneo now, <laughs> a showroom uh, for my collection, and there is also the aspect of uh, money uh, in a moment. Uh, yes, and also the starting point for my interest uh, in this topic was actually security printing, um, and I can show you this there, the beginning of security printing. <laughs> So thank you very much. I think we see the broad range of very interesting phenomena that are depicted. Now we go on from the medium of cash to the medium of sound. We're really happy to have such an expert here. Um, Budadito Chattopatyai, he is an Indian-born artist, researcher, writer and theorist. And I think all of this is true when you will read the text, you will know. Um, he is very interested in the materiality of sound, into its site specificity and also the objecthood of sound. And I think we'll get introduced what he means about objecthood, because this is what he explained to me before, is what we really mean, what we assign to sound. And this is really very individual, su subjective. And he is inviting us to a sound performance right now with the title Eye Contact with the City. Um, it's dealing with urban sound and um, please just listen and for the next 17 minutes. Uh, so this piece is called uh, Eye Contact with the City, which was published as a city, CD uh, in 2013 and uh, thereafter performed in various contexts. It particularly deals with the urban sound and noise, the way we negotiate noise and how I term adaptive perception. Adaptive perception is not um, like abating noise, but how we, in our perception, include noise, um, kind of inclusive approach to urban noise.
Thank you very much for this performance. I hope you had uh, a lot of inspirations. Now I would like um, to say a little thing still more about how such a book is possible, not only because of the authors, not only because of a conference um, can happen, um, all of the people participating, um, but if you make such a book, you need somebody who is really careful about the language and checks the language and uh, gives feedback to the people writing the papers. And um, this was Arturo Silva, which I want to thank you very much and would like to ask you um, to come to us here. Yes, please. And um, how would you make such a book without an editor who is uh, even present at the book presentation? I would like to ask also Andrea Fessel, please come to the stage, please. <laughs> and also Anja Seibenbusch um, Hufschmidt, of course and Pia, and Luise, who did the book with me, and all the authors. Um, the junior, I would like all of you on stage, please. Yeah. The group of everybody, please, in the middle. In the middle is nicer. Yeah, yeah, in the middle, in the middle. You know, I have, I have such a funny form of habit. I need uh, to thank... Uh, People who collaborated with me somehow, at least with a little note, to say you very carefully, thank you. Yeah, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, 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 you can clap your hands, of course, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Ja, natürlich, kannst du deiner Frau mitbringen. Schön, thank you. Applause for you. Please. So thank you. Now, uh, please have a glass of uh, wine or water and we welcome you for a chat about the book.